Uh oh, storm's brewing. What you gonna do? Panic? Or run away? Well, why not just go home and relax on the sofa? How powerful is nature anyway? This is the topic of our next poem. Storm on the Island by Shima Sini is a good poem to try and remember for the exam because it's fairly short and it's written in a particularly clear way. It's not written a long time ago, so the language is pretty modern. As with all the poems, we're going to be taking a look at the uh, context, story, language structure and the reason the poet wrote it. So let's not hang around, let's take a look at the context. Seamus Heaney grew up in Ireland uh, in a farming community. So a lot of his language and a lot of the topics have strong links to Ireland and farming. And therefore, a lot of his poems do cover the topic of nature. And in this particular poem, we'll be looking at the power of nature. You might have noticed that unlike a lot of the other poems, there isn't a lot of historical knowledge that you need to know to be able to understand the context. No World War I, no Charge of the Light Brigade and war with the Russians. Nice and simple. In fact, this could be more or less set at any time in history on any island. And because there isn't very much historical context that uh, is essential to understand the poem, this poem has what you would call a universal message. And that means it really does apply to any island, any storm, anywhere in the world. This will ensure that the poem will appeal to the maximum number of people possible. So enough of a context, let's take a look at the story. So the poem begins telling us that they are prepared. Prepared for something, I'm not too sure exactly what, although the title's given it away. And spoiler alert, there's nothing that they fear. So. Um, although they're prepared for something that perhaps they might be scared of, uh, at the end he decides that there's, uh, it's a huge nothing uh, that he's scared of. So what's going on in the middle? What are they scared of? Or not scared of? Hey? Well, we begin by talking about how great their houses are. Very strong. Nothing can get blown away. So that you can listen to the thing that you fear. In this case being the storm. So much so that you might even forget that uh, this storm is pummeling your house. Pummeling means to beat repeatedly. Outside of the house, there are no trees and no natural shelter, so you do need your house if you're gonna survive this storm. He also reminds us that the sea is exploding down by the cliffs and it's vicious and violent, spitting like a tame cat turned savage. And so whilst this storm goes on, they just sit tight whilst the wind batters their house. And so he says at the end, strange, it's a huge nothing that we fear. So is he scared or is he not scared? I think given all the descriptions of the exploding water and the spray spitting like a tame cat, the fact that there's no natural shelter on the island that you've got to have a house to be able to protect yourself from it. I think, yes, he is slightly unnerved, slightly scared of nature. But the irony of this is that the thing that they're scared of is invisible. What does wind look like? You can't see wind. You can kind of feel it, but what's touching you? Nothing really, just pressure. So in a sense, that's why he's calling it a nothing. See, you can see the effects of a storm. You can see lightning, you can see rain, you can see clouds, and you might be able to feel the wind blowing against you, but you can't see the cause of it. These are the effects of a storm. So you can never see the mysterious power behind all these different effects that we see. And in this sense, it is a huge nothing, a huge invisible power that you can't see really, you can't touch, you can only see the effects of it. And it is this nothing, this thing that you can't see that they're scared of. And that's it. Sitting in a house, being scared of a big nothing. But that big nothing is definitely a threat. Okay, so we've uh, covered the story. Now we need to take a quick look at the language. Uh, nouns, we're talking about uh, squat houses, uh, walls, rock, roof, slate, earth, hay. All of these are very natural objects. And again, this ties in with Seamus Heaney's uh, context of growing up on farms. It also identifies that the strength that they get from houses comes from uh, walls made of rock, things made from the earth. In fact, it is, if you like, nature here that is helping them uh, protect themselves from nature. He's also given it uh, a conversational style, um, as, if she, uh, as if he's talking to us. 
poet's drawing us in, making us feel part of the group. And why has the poet done that? So that we as a reader feel a little more personally involved with the threat he and his friends are facing. Just how dangerous is nature in this poem? Actually pretty dangerous. Let's clear things up a little bit. The poet is using a lot of military language. Let's see a few examples. Blast, exploding, salvo, bombarded, strafes. This ensures we understand that nature is definitely a power here, a threatening power, a violent power, a power to be reckoned with. And if you want to pick out a particular word, I like the word pummels here. Pummels simply means hit repeatedly. And again, this verb gives a nice sense that the people in the house are under attack, constant attack. We've got a nice, easy simile for us to explain. The sea spits like a tame cat turns savage. Let's take a look at some of the words in that simile to be able to explain why it's effective. We've got the word spits. Spit isn't a very nice word. It's also not a very nice action. You wouldn't expect a soldier to spit. A soldier has more respect uh, than that. However, it's quite easy to imagine an animal or a crazy person or something very vicious spitting at you. But why does he say a tame cat turns savage? Why doesn't he just say a cat? Well, he's comparing the sea to the two personalities you get of a cat. If anybody's got a cat, you know what they are. Those two personalities are cute or they want to rip out your eyes because you've briefly touched their belly. <laughs> and in a way, that's just like the sea. The sea can be cute and kind and beautiful and gentle, but then it can also be violent and savage and wild. Savage, again, is a lovely adjective describing the sea and it means wild and something uncontrollable. The power of nature is wild, is uncontrollable. So I suppose all you can do is hide in your house. Build your houses squat. Squat means short. If they're too tall, they're going to blow away. So build strong houses. You can't attack nature, you can only defend yourself against it. And then we finish with that metaphor. It is a huge nothing that we fear. And this metaphor is really interesting because it seems to be saying the opposite. I mean, if you've got nothing, then you've got nothing. If I hold, hold nothing in my hands, it doesn't weigh anything. It's not small, it's not big, it's nothing. But the poet gives us this, an oxymoron, which is where you have two opposites put together. An oxymoron is a figure of speech that kind of says contradictory things. They seem to cancel each other out. So it's not literally nothing. There's definitely something there because he uses the adjective huge. It's a huge nothing. So like I said before, although you can't see or hear or taste or touch the power of a storm, you can still see the effects. And so although there appears to be nothing creating the effects, the effects are so enormous, like lightning, like the wind, like the sea crashing and uh, spitting, there has to be something there. And that something has to be huge. And yeah, if you're sitting there listening to this and watching this and thinking, well, that's a bit weird. I don't quite get what the poet's trying to say. The poet admits it. The poet even tells us, yeah, this is kind of strange. Okay, let's take a look at the structure. First of all, we can say there's no rhyming, but there are 10 syllables per line. Count them. We are prepared, we build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. So again, like some of the other poems, you've got this structured, unstructured structure, which sounds pretty crazy, but not really. There's two different effects the poet's trying to achieve. The unstructured nature of the poem gives it this conversational tone. It feels like we are talking together. And we spoke earlier on about how you have these little uh, conversational asides, again, adding to the sense that we're having a conversation. And if you combine this with who the narrator is, we've got another poem where the narrator is not just the first person, but the first person plural. Here again, the poet is joining us together as a collective, as a group. The poem Exposure did something similar. And because we are all in it together, readers and the uh, people stuck in the houses themselves, we as readers find it easier to imagine ourselves there as well. We find it easier to relate to what the poet is trying to get across. And the third comment we can say about structure is how does it begin? How does it end? It begins with 
Great confidence. We are prepared. But it ends with this slightly less confident, fearful ending that although there's nothing really out there, they are still scared. There is something to fear. And yeah, the poet admits that's kind of strange. So let's see what we've covered. We've covered the context, the story, the language, the structure. So we now need to take a look at the intention. And as with all these poems, we're considering what's the intention in terms of power. Uh, all these poems are about power and conflict. So what does the poet want to tell us? Well, we're talking about the power of nature, obviously. And we know that without houses to protect ourselves, we are going to be victims of nature. And we build our houses from nature using bricks and rocks and slate. So perhaps the only way that we can have any control over the power of nature is by using nature itself. This suggests that we as human beings really aren't very powerful at all. We need nature to help us fight nature. In this poem, humans are weak, nature is powerful. And we kind of learn something from this poem. We learn something about ourselves, that we can be scared of something we can't see. And often we are more scared of the things we can't see than we are of the things we can. I mean, look, put it this way. There's something a little less scary about seeing an attacker actually come towards you because there's something you can kind of do about it. That's not as scary as the idea of somebody creeping up behind you and stabbing you. It's all about the fear of the unknown. Things we don't know are often more scary than the things that we do. And nature has immense power over us. But you can't see nature coming at you. You can't turn around and punch nature in the face. Nature is an invisible, unknown force that ultimately you can only defend yourself against. You will never ever be able to attack it. So I suppose whether or not you understand this poem comes down to the sort of person you are. Would you prefer to see your attacker or would you prefer not to see your attacker which is more scary? For the poet, the attacker you can't see. And finally let's have a quick consideration about what sort of poems uh, would be good to compare this with. Exposure is a good one uh, particularly because you've got the uh, power of nature literally uh, killing the poet and his pals. You could even compare it to something like Ozymandias. Ozymandias is a poem about how power, no matter how big, no matter how strong, will always die. But Seamus Heaney has shown us that nature will not die. It's not physical like human beings. It's not made of stuff like the Industrial Revolution, factories and so on. Nature is this big nothing but big and powerful. Compares really nicely as well, I think, to Prelude, the way that nature here freaks out the poet. Whereas in uh, Prelude, the poet is freaked out. Uh, in Storm on the Island, the poet considers it more merely just strange. It might be because William Wordsworth did take quite a few drugs in his life. Uh, Seamus Heaney less so, probably none, I imagine. I'd have another chance to ask him, uh, so I imagine William Wordsworth was a lot more jittery in the brain perhaps, so that he was more terrified of nature, whereas Seamus Heaney just thinks it's a bit strange. Okay, so we've managed to cover the context, story, language, structure and the reason why the writer wrote it, plus what you can compare it to. Good luck with your revision everybody, not too long now.